we have a very important session. This is session four of the uh, conference. Uh, we have the special lecture by a, a very eminent uh, speaker, Professor Bruce Alberts. He is a very good friend of uh, the foundation. In normal times, we will, uh, you know, we we will have the pleasure of having him here in the in Chennai and also in the midst of us. But this Corona has really, you know, made us to connect to him in the virtual mode. But nevertheless, you know, whenever humanity is facing a crisis, we always listen to the learned persons and take their advice so that uh, the uh, society can move from darkness to um, light. And with their help only, the humanity is able to come out of very difficult situations in the past. Taking uh, the lessons from the history, it will be a it is now very, very important that we listen to Professor Bruce Alberts, um, you know, his, his background in uh, biochemistry and so on. is going to help us to understand how we have to, you know, conduct ourselves and move forward. So this is not just for uh, the disease alone, for the whole humanity, how we can proceed and things like that. With this brief introduction about the uh, special lecture, I wish to introduce uh, Professor Bruce Alberts. Uh, he is a prominent biochemist with a strong commitment to the improvement of science and mathematics education and was awarded the National Medal of uh, Science by the President Obama in 2014. He served as the editor-in-chief between 2008 to 2013 and as one of the President Obama's first three United States science envoys, 2019-11. Alberts holds the Chancellor Leadership Chair in Biochemistry. Sorry for the interruption. Alberts holds the Chancellor Leadership Chair in Biochemistry and Biophysics for Science and Education at the University of California, San Francisco, to which he returned after serving two six-year terms as President of the National Academy of Sciences. He has that distinction. During his tenure at the NAS, Alba, uh, NAS, Professor was instrumental in developing the landmark national science education standards. You know, foundation, he is uh, right from the uh, beginning. Uh, Professor Alberts is a very, you know, he used to get associated with many of the program. I fondly recall the um, village knowledge center he inaugurated at the Pondicherry. He and his wife were kind enough to be with us. And uh, even today, the village community is extremely grateful to you, Professor. And uh, whenever we, when we go, when we go there, they recall your, uh, you know, the photographs are there still on the, uh, you know, walls of the village knowledge center. And uh, this is how, you know, on one side his uh, position as the president of the academy, on the other side how he got connected with the village society. This is what is making him very, very unique. And we are all very eager to listen to you, Professor. Before I start, Professor M.S. Swaminathan is also in the line. Uh, may I request Professor M.S. Swaminathan to speak a few words, and then you can start your presentation. Uh, over to you, Professor. I request you to kindly offer your felicitations. So I will take more. The assignment of giving a lecture. You are one of the most persuasive lecturers in the world. Uh, there is always some interruption, but I'm because of Corona. Because of Corona, we could not hope to have you in Chennai. That's my only regret. I hope we will make it up soon. We are all looking forward to listening. To you. Thank you again, Bruce, and your wife for your humanitarian uh, attitude, apart from being top scientist, you are a top humanitarian. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. It's Professor, we are not able to listen to you. Your voice okay. is muted. 
I'm mute. Okay. Uh, yes. Now we are able to listen to you. <laughs> okay. yeah, I request okay. you to give your uh, lecture. All right. Thank you. Uh, before I start my slides, I just want to say uh, it's a pleasure to be here, if only remotely. Uh, as you'll hear, I, um, I, I have um, spent a lot of time in, with M.S. Swaminathan, and I owe him a great deal for everything uh, he taught me. And you'll hear a little bit that, that uh, in this talk. Exactly one year ago, I was there on the stage with you. So unfortunately, uh, you know, the virus is pre preventing a lot of uh, things that we would like to be doing. Uh, all right, I'm going to try to share my uh, screen here. See if it works. <laughs> yeah, we are all able to see your slides. You, uh, this is the, this is the end of my talk. So this is not good. <laughs> I have to go the other direction. <laughs> Just backwards. <laughs> I gave away the punchline. <laughs> all right, that's the now we're now we're doing better. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm going to start by giving uh, a little bit of uh, history with, that's relevant to this talk. Uh, I, I first uh, visited uh, with you at, at the foundation in 1999, uh, and that, uh, that taught me a lot about uh, what science can do for society. Um, and that, at that time, I was president of the National Academy of Sciences, so I uh, actually had resources and I could do things uh, that I wanted to do, uh, and we did many things that probably would not have been done had I not visited Chennai, and I came back many times, probably once a year, once at least once a year, uh, every two years. And here's a picture from my first uh, visit at, at the village, uh, I think it's Emblem Village, uh, my wife and I with MS. Uh, and the, of course, the uh, really uh, heart of the village were these women who were so um, impressively uh, intelligent and able to bring the wisdom of science through the wireless internet to that village. This is uh, a picture taken at first visit. Um, I've since been back to that the village many times. Uh, and then uh, I learned about how science could actually help even the very poorest people um, develop livelihoods and improve their health and their live, lives. And uh, this is just an example of one of the projects that uh, your foundation had catalyzed through uh, connections uh, to these village knowledge centers. This is just one of the many places I visited. Later, uh, I learned about how the Bank of uh, State Bank of India was involved, and all these very clever schemes for um, lending uh, money to self-help groups. Uh, here's a picture of my wife handing out a check to a woman who was going to start a little dairy with uh, one cow, I think. At any rate, uh, I, I I think uh, that experience helped me um, in this um, very important uh, report from our academy called Our Common Journey, A Transition Towards Sustainability. It's hard to imagine now, but at that time, nobody was talking about sustainability. It was sort of a, a fringe idea, and the academy produces this very important uh, report that promoted what they called sustainability science, and it was certainly influenced by uh, India. From India, I, I also learned um, about Prime Minister Nehru's uh, insistence on what he called a scientific temper. I, I had never heard of the word scientific temper before, but I, since then I've used it all the time. I learned that we need much more of the creativity, rationality, openness, and tolerance that are inherent to science 
in, in every society, and especially for very um, heterogeneous uh, democracies with people who have to learn to be tolerant of each other and, and, and treat each other with respect. Here's some values of science that I think are critical. Uh, I'll talk more about science shortly, but the values of science, not just the findings of science are important. Then for science to work, you have to have honesty, you, you have to have generosity, you have to have especially a strong demand for evidence, but yet be open to all ideas, opinions, uh, irrespective of who says, uh, uh, presents an idea. A, a graduate student may have a, a better idea than a Nobel Prize winner's, and, and you have to be open to that because that's how science advances. This is my favorite quote. It's from a wonderful little book still in print by the physicist Jacob Bronowski called Science and Human Values. Bronowski, when he was a young man, flew over Hiroshima, uh, the, the anniversary of dropping the atomic bomb is actually this week, and there's a lot on American television about uh, Hiroshima and atomic weapons and the devastation they caused. And shortly after the bomb uh, went off, Bronowski, who was in the British Army, flew over Hiroshima and uh, was very depressed about uh, what had happened. And he wondered whether science was good or possibly science was bad for the world. And he spent the next 10 years or so reading, thinking, and writing this little book. Uh, and he concluded, of course, that unbalanced science is important and very good for the society. He said that the society of scientists is simple because it has a directing purpose to explore the truth. Nevertheless, it has to solve the problem of every society, which is to find a compromise between the individual and the group. It must encourage a single scientist to be independent and the body of a scientist to be tolerant. And very importantly, he ended his uh, conclusion that science has humanized our values. Men and women have asked for freedom, justice, and respect, precisely as the scientific spirit has spread among them. And then, so in, after 12 years at the Academy, every year I had to give a, an annual report as a, a speech at our annual meeting. And of course, uh, here, here's my last speech, summing up creating a scientific temper for the world. Uh, this is, a, again, uh, I never heard of scientific temper, and I probably would have never heard of it had I not been to India. Here's a, uh, an excerpt from my letter to MS on the occasion of his 80th birthday. He's having lots of birthdays. <laughs> we need many more of them, MS. Uh, I wrote, I, I want to thank you for the education and the inspiration you have provided to me and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences over the past eight years. Through your wisdom and example, you have made us aware of the enormous good that can be provided to the world, world's poor through both science and the worth, work of scientists. So, so this, the MS uh, and uh, my, my many trips to your foundation had a profound effect on my tenure, my 12 years at the academy. Later, when I moved to science, I, I made, took advantage of what I had learned about India to bring India into the pages of, of, of Science Magazine. Uh, of course, MS wrote uh, editorial. Uh, CNR Rao wrote, wrote a wonderful editorial about science and the future of India. And then uh, Dr. Michelle Carr, uh, long before a young academy of India had been founded, and now it's founded, many years before it was founded, he wrote a strong editorial in science arguing that India should form this, uh, this organization. I'll, I'll mention this kind of uh, organization later. It's very important, I think, for the, all, all the goals of science in the world. And then I had a wonderful trip to India in April of 2013, my last year at Science Magazine with the science news team. And we visited many universities and uh, IITs. 
and government agencies to see what science was doing for India, and that led to this uh, very one uh, really uh, eye-opening essay. I hope many people around the world uh, learned a lot from it. Uh, called Science for All, and of course, here's a picture of the cover. It had the farm, farmer's field with a with a, uh, Indian woman in in, in the field. Uh, so now I want to turn to the issue, really. Uh, what about what is science, and how do we um, improve and protect it? Uh, and before I could do anything about uh, spreading science through the world, we have to really understand what's unique about it. And I, I think it's really amazing that science was invented. <laughs> it had to be invented. Uh, it was invented less than 400 years ago as a community effort. Uh, and this is a wonderful quote from uh, another Indian, <laughs> Prasadis Skupa. He's a distinguished professor at Cambridge University in the UK. He said, today we take it for granted that the institution of science, this science has incentives which encourage researchers to disclose their findings for public use. And he calls them social contrivances. And he says that these were not inevitable and it, to establish these principles uh, took the collective eff effort of scientists and their patrons to establish them. Uh, this started, you know, in the Royal Society uh, in, in the UK, uh, and uh, this has really now had enormous um, effects on the world because of the way that science works. Uh, you have to you have to give up all your results to everybody else, tell them all your secrets, and uh, in return you get not money, but you get self, you get esteem. You get you have to. Have, have to be part of the community and appreciate uh, being part of a community because the com science is very much a community effort. And so uh, Das Gupta concludes, uh, to enable science to be effective requires a considerable part of a scientist's education in developing a, ta involves developing a taste for non-monetary rewards that is respect of your colleagues. And he concludes very importantly and very central to the, the theme of this talk that the institution of science embodies a set, set of cultural values that are in need of constant protection. As he emphasized, in fact, many cultural values that scientists must constantly work to protect. And of course, in this talk, I cannot go through more than a few of them. Uh, there's always more that can and should be done to enforce scientific standards by the scientific community and make sure that science continues to work effectively. Here I'm just going to focus, because of what MS wanted me to talk about, on a little bit on scientific publishing. Uh, so inspire, improving scientific publication will require making what scientists publish more widely accessible. Of course, the internet is an incredible device for spreading science around the world. But for too many uh, people, they, the, the science is not accessible because it, it comes from private publishing companies and you have to pay money for a prescription. And I first became aware of this problem when I was visiting. I could tell exactly where I was. I was in Nehru University in Delhi sitting down with some uh, young scientists, and I was so surprised to find that they didn't have access to the, to, to the, to the scientific literature. And uh, at that point, India, you know, a university in India had to pay to get the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, an important scientific journal. And we then developed the scheme to make it the, our journal that's still uh, true uh, it's immediately free to everyone in 139 developing nations, and everywhere else it's free after six months. So making it free only after six months in the United States and Europe enables the journal to get enough resources from libraries to uh, support the, the, the journal. And we, do, we don't make any money, but we don't subsidize it. Basically, it's a compromise to try to get science out uh, in, a, in a 
as widely as possible. Improving scientific publication will also require making what scientists publish more rapidly accessible. And this has led to uh, a, a, a great movement that's been fantastically important in the COVID era, uh, the great expanse of use of preprint servers in biology. Preprint servers were used in physics for decades, but biologists have only recently uh, taken to routinely using them. And this is an article in the Virginia National Academy of Sciences that helped to catalyze this major change um, by my colleague, Ron, Ron Bale, uh, who uh, is very imaginative and uh, explains why it's critical to have results out faster. Now, this is uh, another major um, issue today. Improving scientific publications will also require improving the standards for peer review. And, and, and specifically, there's this relatively new phenomena of what are called predatory scientific journals. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I, I never had imagined that this would happen, but with uh, scientists paying to uh, publish their paper now in, for open access, it led to this uh, whole very large uh, movement to uh, publish uh, papers that really are, are, are not peer reviewed, but pretend to be peer reviewed. And this is degrading the scientific enterprise and confusing people. And it's, uh, and it's important that we stop it. And so here's what uh, happening. Uh, there's a new project of the Inter-Academy Partnership. This is a collection of 140 scientists, science academies from around the world called the IAP. Uh, we'll hear more about the IAP later, but it's a global network of engineering, science, and medical academies. And they have this new project called Com Combating Predatory uh, Academic Journals and Conferences. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this um, committee that's preparing this uh, project uh, has co-chairs from South Africa and Bangladesh, and they're going to have a um, important uh, report completed by December next year. The goals of the study are to examine efforts to date to combat predatory and fake journals, publishers, and conferences around the world, and to design clear journal and conference standards uh, applicable across fields for assessing what is a real conference and what is not, and what is a real journal and what is not, and then to provide concrete recommendations for fixing the problem, aiming at the academic community, funders of research, universities, administrators, and policy uh, makers. So this is an example of how the scientific community is trying to police itself and make sure that science continues to work effectively. So let's I'll turn to some, some uh, other issues, the broad issue of, of science communication. Before I, I get into some uh, um, particular uh, ideas about what we sh might do about science communication, I just want to point out uh, uh, this um, important distinction between what an individual scientist does and what the products of all that uh, different scientists working uh, to disprove or prove each other, that whole community, uh, it's a whole community that produces what is called science, capital S science. What an individual scientist produce, you, you might call it science with a small s, but you know, often it's wrong. Uh, you know, the, it, we're all testing ideas and testing each other. And as uh, Pierre Hollenberg pointed out, capital S science emerges from small s science as collective public knowledge, universal and free of contradiction, only after being repeatedly tested by independent scientific investigations. And, and, and th that is an, an imp important understanding that, that society needs to, to, to know because 
I think most of the society has no idea how science works, and that has major consequences, as I'll say in a second. The, success, the amazing success of big capitalized science in the past three centuries uh, has enabled humans to reach a remarkable understanding of the natural world, and this understanding makes our lives much more stable, effective, and predictable. And this little cartoon, of course, is one example of many, many. So individual communities and nations must all make long-range decisions based on what scientists do and do not know. And there, therefore, everybody needs to understand the difference between small as science, what any one scientist might say, because scientists always disagree with each other, and capitalist science, uh, and understand how you get uh, through evidence-based uh, processes from one to the other, so that capitalist science will have a larger effect on the world. And here's the big but. Uh, I live, of course, in the United States, and we have political leaders who uh, do not believe, really, in science, do not understand it. And they somehow feel comfortable denying publicly what science knows on issues that range from protecting uh, our citizens from the virus, uh, which is partly why our, our United States is so terribly, tragically affected by this disease. But, but every, on every, all issues from protecting us from the virus to climate change, many others. And the fact that politicians can get away with uh, this is a danger to any democracy. And to me, it represents a general failure of both science education and science communication. So it's a real challenge to all those of us who are scientists, what to do. And we need to spend all of us more time and focus on these issues. Uh, I think many people in the world, many scientists in the United States have woken up to the fact that not paying enough attention to what the public understands about science is dangerous. It's killing many uh, thousands of Americans right now. So I would conclude to create a scientific temper for the world, is, which is what we need. <laughs> uh, we need a new type of science education for everyone. Uh, this, uh, this is not a new idea. This is there's a famous American uh, educator, John Dewey, long time ago, almost 100 years ago. He really uh, said everything that I'm saying now. But we need to figure out how to accomplish it. The fact that we've known about this so long without making that much progress is uh, shows that we have to put much more effort and thought into it. So every child of scientist, and this is what science should look like in school. These are 12-year-old students in San Francisco, noisy classroom, students are solving problems. The teacher is a coach, not telling them uh, all the answers. They have to find out the answers themselves. So a basic principle is that all, at all levels, teachers should make students struggle with a problem before they're told the answer. And, and good, there's very good education research that shows that this is a powerful way to generate deeper, more meaningful learning. Unfortunately, it's not the way most classes are taught today. Here's an example of, a, of, of the first year of school. It's actually what was the official curriculum in San Francisco in 1993 when I left. I was helping with this. Uh, all the first year, five-year-old students come in uh, at the right time of year when there are seeds on the ground. They put on clean white socks and round around, walk under the trees in the schoolyard. They come back, their socks are all dirty. They took off the socks and they take, uh, cut all the black specks with little forceps and put each one in a different numbered square. So square number one has a, has a black speck. Square number two has another black speck. And then they have a little uh, $3 plastic microscope and they draw what each one speck actually looks like. And then they have a big argument about, uh, you know, which ones are seeds and which one are just dirt. Now, most of them will be dirt, but some of them will be seeds because seeds evolved to stick to animal fur, so they stick the socks. And uh, if this is taught right, eventually some five-year-old says, well, I think the round ones, the regular shaped ones, the round ones are seeds. 
and the teacher doesn't say yes, the uh, teacher said, asks the other kids what they think. And eventually, a good teacher gets the, the class to agree that's a possibility, that all the round ones and the regular shaped ones are seeds and the other ones are not. And then they have another day of discussion, well, what can we do to test the idea? And eventually, some five-year-old proposed we could plant uh, all the round ones in one pot and plant all the other ones in another pot and see if they only get plants growing in, in one. But anyway, this uh, kind of teaching is, you know, shows that even five-year-olds can think scientifically if guided appropriately by the teacher. So this is called inquiry-based science education. Uh, and uh, it's been promoted by the network of academies for 20 years. And so you can imagine education includes solving hundreds of such challenges over the course of schooling. I believe that children who are prepared for life in this way would be great problem solvers in the workplace. They'd be able to be useful and make uh, contributions to businesses. They'd be able to make wise judgments for their family, their community, and their nation. And very importantly, they'd be adults who reject what we call magical thinking. Magical thinking is like, uh, you know, our, our president announced that he thinks after the election the virus is just going to go away. I mean, that is magical thinking. <laughs> uh, but there's many other kinds of magical thinking. And uh, yeah, so, so many people uh, don't have the ability, the education to disagree with him. So to remove, this is what my friends don't like to hear. They, they, they know there's a problem with education at lower levels, but they don't like to admit that a lot of that problem is their fault. Because when you teach science at the college level the first year, you're really defining what biology education should be. And first year chemistry defines what chemistry education should be. And so on. So we, we who are scientists, we who are professors, really have to set the prototype for what science education should be and set an example because we teach all the people who become teachers of what teaching science should be like. And we're very slow to do that. Usually we just talk at the students, we just lecture, but happily things are changing. This is a, a first year college biology class in Minnesota. University of Minnesota teaches all 3,000 of their first-year biology students through active learning. They do it in 20 different smaller classrooms. Um, this is a very effective way of, of teaching. There's lots of research about this. Uh, the, the Academy has summarized all this research and introduced a document called Reaching Students, What Research Says About Effective uh, Education for Science and Engineering. Uh, this is designed specifically for college fa faculty, and you can get a free PDF download of all our, the Academy reports, including this one. And so far, I think we've convinced about one out of every five professors in Amer America to change how they teach. So we still have a long ways to go, but we're making progress. So I just want to uh, really end by talking about being even more ambitious. What, this, this crisis, the virus crisis, the, the democracy crisis, the, the rise of, uh, of, of uh, illogical uh, policies, people who fool people all the time, uh, uh, really makes science education change uh, critical to the future of the world. So the, the, here, here are four increasingly ambitious goals for science education. The first one has long been the standard view of what science edu education should do. That is, provide all adults with a general sense of what scientists have discovered about the world. You know, everybody should know, uh, you know, the vast expense of the universe, that all life is made of cells, so on and so on. Uh, and uh, this is all, basically all that we've generally focus on, except for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, we've been realizing this is not enough. Uh, second, more ambitious than this, would be to provide all adults with an ability to investigate scientific problems as scientists do, using logic, experiment, and evidence. And that's really what inquiry-based science education has been uh, all about. You know, every child a scientist. Let them do 
uh, work together in groups and solve problems like the White Sox problem <laughs> and many more complicated problems. So they could think scientifically about uh, the practical problem. Uh, a, th a, th a third uh, really critical uh, goal of science education, which we have not focused on, is to provide all adults with an understanding of how the scientific enterprise works and why they should therefore trust the consensus judgments of science on issues like smoking, vaccination, and camp climate change. That is just capital S science. The, if you understand how capital S science reaches these judgments, then you can respect it. In the United States, we get politicians who say such crazy things like, well, climate change was just a, a hoax of scientists designed to get them research grants. You know, a politician couldn't say that if the, the public actually understood how science science works. And then, of course, the most ambitious uh, aim would provide all adults with the habit of solving their everyday problems as scientists do using logic, experiment, and so on. So this uh, will require what's called transference from what is learned in science class to general habits of mind. And this is, we know this is difficult. and. So we don't, these last two things, we need to do experiments and figure out how to make them uh, effective. And so to achieve these critical ambitious goals, scientists must get involved. And here's one way that we are getting involved through the World Science Academy is the, the same IAP that I mentioned before, Interacademy Partnership. Uh, I just want to advertise it. It's a project called Science Driven by Local Action. Uh, uh, science for Global Goals. It focuses on the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a framework, and it's a partnership between the science academies and the Smithsonian Science Education Center, Center in Washington, D.C. They're, they're producing free curricula to empower young people ages 8 to 17 to use science for social good in many different languages. And so far, the three modules they've finished are on the virus, <laughs> how can I protect myself and others from COVID-19, on food, and on mosquitoes, uh, and the mosquito-borne diseases. I, here's some examples of what students do in groups. The first unit was mosquitoes, so that had all this uh, uh, research done and see how to make it work. The, the, the students work with volunteers in the communities uh, to map their community, develop where mosquitoes live, to investigate how to control the mosquito population near their school and their neighborhood and so on. And this is uh, pictures of students in Panama, Malawi. Really active science, but science that actually makes a difference. You start young children worrying about how to use science to improve their local environment. And so here's what's next. They want to produce some modules on energy, water, cities, pollution, so on. And that, just to connect you to this project, it's led by uh, Dr. Carol O'Donnell. There are emails here, but uh, you could Google uh, Science for Global Goals and you'll find all the curriculum on the web. And uh, I urge people uh, in India to get involved. I know the academy has already connected the, at least uh, one of the academies. <laughs> I, I don't know how many. So I just want to end with the optimistic <laughs> fact that scientists uh, really do form a wonderful world community. We have a set of common set of values. We can communicate well uh, uh, across nations who don't even uh, ha have uh, relations with each other. Uh, this is a, uh, an example. There were 15 Academy members uh, after a meeting in Switzerland, and we were stopped for breakfast in a McDonald's, so you can see the cups. But you're only seeing a few of the Academy presidents here, but there are two Academy presidents from India, Prakash Chand and Gavurdan Mehta, two former INSA presidents. Or that, that, at that time, uh, they were presidents. <laughs> and uh, J Japan, China, Sweden in this particular picture. And I just want to emphasize a new development developed by Germany. Uh, the, 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 it's called a Young Academy. Uh, and it's, 
young means 35 to 40 year olds. Here's the pictures of the young academies in uh, in uh, Scotland and South America, uh, South Africa, South Africa and Scotland. But now there are 40 nations with such academies. They're, the Germans have uh, been very good about uh, funding a global young academy headquartered in Berlin that works to support the whole network of young academies. And there is, in fact, now <laughs> uh, a, an Indian Young Academy. I try to get their pictures, but uh, in order, <laughs> this is uh, indicative of why people like me are not good at science communication. In order to get their pictures, I had to use Facebook, and I didn't <laughs> know how to do it. <laughs> so the world really badly needs the Young Academies. They're all over social media. We are not. The world is uh, connected by social media, so most of us older folks are not really connected to the world so we need these young academies to uh, really uh, reach out and spread science and good science education around the world the u.s has a incipient young academy and i hope very soon there'll be an announcement that finally we're going to have a young academy too as part of this wonderful network okay so this is the, my end to create a scientific temper for the world the challenges ahead for scientists are enormous, but inspired by MS Swaminathan's great accomplishment, his vision and energy, we, we shall find a way. And I just, my last slide is just to wish uh, MS a, a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's a very, very interesting lecture, and a lot of questions are also coming. And before we go to the question, I uh, personally, you know, we all enjoyed your lecture. You touched upon uh, the uh, various, uh, you know, dimensions of science, where a Nobel laureate as well as a young research fellow are uh, almost equal when, when it comes to scientific inquiry is com uh, concerned. You also mentioned about the pitfalls, about the predatory journals and how to safeguard science from that, and also showed us the way how we can inculcate the scientific temper and uh, the how to reach out to students and things like that. With this few uh, remarks, I uh, hand over the uh, mic to my colleague, Dr. Gayatri, who will put the questions to you, and uh, it will be uh, it will be nice if you can kindly address them. Dr. Gayatri, uh, very inspiring lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first question is from uh, Mr. Ravi. Uh, uh, what he's asking is, uh, what more can be done to take science from the uh, lab to the land? And this is more in relation to uh, agricultural sciences. What, what are the practical uh, uh, things that we can do to take the uh, discoveries or the um, things which happen in the, la uh, in the lab, from, uh, from the lab to the land, uh, for farmers? Uh, you know, I'm, uh, MS is the person to ask. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think he's also providing I mean, the answer. I know, everything I, I, I know about this, I learned uh, in India. So, uh, you know, uh, in that visit of Science Magazine also, we went to, uh, we went to the uh, several other places that were working uh, on creating connections to uh, help farmers electronically. Of course, that first knowledge center, the first, um, I guess they had 30 or so initially, they, they were using wireless internet to get uh, from Pondicherry to the surrounding villages. But now everybody's got uh, you know, cell phones. And so uh, the technology and the, uh, and the uh, ability to connect people is, is great, even greater. And uh, I know that India had a wonderful plans to connecting me people. I know that there have been many wonderful experiments done in India that is uh, projects. And uh, your foundations then many others have done. But my, 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 uh, my basic recommendation for India has been a long time. Everybody has their own project. And what we need is we need uh, an honest evaluation about, for example, if you want to improve agriculture, there's probably 50, 50 imaginative programs in India. Uh, and 
uh, what would really make a difference is getting an academy or some um, some objective body to actually do an evaluation and study. You know, what are the what have we learned, and what, which projects are, are you know we learn a lot from failures, but usually we don't admit our failures. So. It would be important for this group to look at what didn't work as well as what did work and try to create a what we might call a science of trying to help poor villages in agriculture, for example. But, you know, somehow, uh, my experience, I know there was some attempt to do some of that in India. Uh, I, I had the impression that Indians don't like to criticize each other by admitting something is better than something else. And so it's, it's really hard to do uh, science, unless you're going to be objective and, 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 you know, admit failure and try to learn from failure. And so my one recommendation in this whole field, maybe it's been done now, but I, you know, to really take all these wonderful things that happen in India, all these charismatic people doing wonderful things, trying to improve livelihoods and actually try to make a science out of that by, by, by saying, what have we learned? What doesn't work? What does work and why? Uh, the other question is from uh, Mr. Ram Janki Ram and also from Dr. Rajiv Vashne. Both are uh, like kind of related to each other. One is how does one do science communication? And the other issue is uh, uh, while, while uh, scientific organizations like ICRISAT have a, or, and other organizations have a role in science education and communication for society, in the current area of social media, when news spreads much faster, than we can ever imagine. How do we do, how do we uh, control fake news and misinterpretation of science on the net? And I think what is also needed and is the need of the hour is how do, how, how do we train scientists to become communicators? Or do we need a separate interface as a communi co science communication as a separate uh, stream which, which communicates with the people who do science in the lab and how is this brought out in a manner which is accurate and relevant for the present times without misinterpretation. So, you know, this is a huge, what you're talking about is a huge problem that, that you know, it used to, I'll talk about the United States. It used to be we had national television and that we had people who were, uh, you know, taking all the information in society and, and trying to make sense of it. And they interpreted different, but they weren't crazy. <laughs> They're all responsible. Now we have crazy people on the internet who have more followings than the people who are actually uh, knowledgeable often because crazy ideas, some, some, you know, they're more fun for people and they, they retweet them more often. We know that fake news is retweeted much more often than real news. So first of all, uh, it's going to have to be uh, social media <laughs> that we're communicating. You know, the, the, most people don't read newspapers. They don't listen to uh, you know new, news programs that are really um, the kind of news programs that we used to have that actually made a cohesive, more co cohesive society. So, so it's got to be done by young people who understand social media. I would argue that. Of course, we need professional scientific communicators, but in that world, you really also need, you know, anybody with a, a talent for it who's a scientist to also be involved. And, uh, you know, I think this would be a, an interesting uh, thing to point. This is this is the Young Academy. Uh, people, they have to th try to do experiments. And so what, what would really work? Uh, no, should every graduate student be, uh, you know, given training and uh, and have experience in working with other graduate students, not only to do their experiments, but say two hours a week trying to communicate science on social media? It's going to take young people to do this. You know, if, if I if I <laughs> if I talk to you know a, a typical person, I have an image. I look like an arrogant scientist and. You know, the, 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 but but the young people, uh, and that, we've seen this in the young academies. Every young academy I know about, you know, the, the Germans were the first to point this out. I worked in Indonesia. I was science uh, envoy to Indonesia. 
Indonesian Young Academy I know very well, the, 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 the big politicians want to talk to the young scientists. They don't want to talk to the old scientists. Partly the old scientists uh, look, reminds them of their old professor who gave them a bad grade or <laughs> they think we're arrogant or, but, but, but it's hard for them to feel that way about young scientists who remind them probably of their children or their grandchildren. So I think, I think uh, the, the big push should be to get young scientists into the habit of, uh, of, of being science commuter, communicators and science connectors. You know, I, I think we, in this uh, virus um, disaster that we have, say, in the United States, there's so much fake information. And uh, this would seem to be a, a good way of, uh, and the fake information doesn't interact with the people who correct fake information. You study these networks, they're all talking to each other. So try to get some young people from those communities where this, uh, you know, where, you know, the parts of the country where the, this fake information is most uh, effective, uh, you know, telling people don't wear a mask, you know, <laughs> Ma mask cause disease. They, they, you know, they just said it's almost as if, uh, you know, this somebody, uh, some foreign government is trying to sabotage the United States. But these people just have all these crazy ideas, and somehow those spread more effectively than the right ideas. So I think this is a task for the young academies. We need their wisdom, we need their ideas, we need to support their experiments. And they, you know, the 35 year olds then connect to the 25 year olds, <laughs> the graduate students. And I think everybody has to be involved, but I, I'm not the person to know how to do this. I can't even, can't even find my, uh, I can't even find the young Indian Young Academy on Facebook. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so it's a great question, and uh, it's an urgent issue. It's it's really destroying our democracy. People don't share. Uh, they don't. All these everything's fake. You know, the people who, who on one side think you know wear a mask is the fake news. You know, nobody is discriminated between what's real and what's not. It's you know, incredibly dangerous. Uh, you know, Carl Sagan wrote, uh, wrote a wonderful book, the astronomer, popularizer of science in the United States. He wrote, wrote uh, well, the, it was like science is a candle in the dark. I mean, basically that science is the way to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to lead the public from magical thinking that we're, you know, that we're so, humans seem to like better than <laughs> factual thinking, uh, lead them away from magical thinking to thinking that will enable them to have successful lives. Uh, uh, there's another question from uh, Mehtab Bamji to, uh, what is your belief and interpretation of the concept of God and in importance of religion? And how how would you, is there any link between science and spirituality and uh, where should you separate the two? So, so I, the, our, our academy has, uh, the United States Academy has done a lot of work on this issue because uh, there's a huge controversy in the United States about biological evolution and whether it should be taught in schools. Um, the official policy of the science standards from the most states say that you should teach evolution, but people somehow uh, object to that as being anti-religious. So we produced uh, many booklets, they're all available on the world, uh, web. It's called uh, Science, Creationism, and Evolution. That's one of the, Science, Creationism, and Evolution. These are designed for, for, for just uh, the public. And the position that our academy has repeatedly taken, uh, and we've had support from, you know, these these, re these these short reports. These are popular booklets, have statements from religious figures that who agree with us, and so on. That religious way of thinking and scientific way of thinking uh, don't really uh, uh, conflict with each other. Religion deal science can only deal with things that are you know, reproducible and uh, can be observed through experiments and 
and and and the religious uh, way of thinking is a is a different uh, uh, different sphere, and and so our the academy's consistent position has been uh, we 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 don't have anything that we could say constructively about religion as scientists, and and the people who are religious should not try to say what we found from science uh, contest, you know, when we find that it's, it's very clear that, that, you know, evolution is a very fundamental basis, Darwinian uh, evolution of, of how we understand biology, and religious people should not try to uh, create a science in conflict with, you know, there's something called, for example, intelligent design, which is an alternate theory of how uh, evolution works, and it, it's, it's not scientific, and uh, it's a religious view of biology. So, so, so we basically uh, both should support each other's enterprises. Uh, major religious figures support this uh, view, and I think it's a very uh, it's the only really way that science, science and religion uh, in society can be effective together, because they're both they're both important for human humanity. Uh, I think uh, there's another question. Most of them are related to communication in uh, science, but I think I have one question to you, sir, and that is um, there's increasing pressure to publish for scientists. There's also open access. So um, how do you balance the two? How do you get scientific organizations to make sure what is not predatory? And uh, uh, how, what should the uh, Indian scientific community and also government organizations which deal with science do to ensure that uh, predatory journalism is reduced? And also, uh, how can we make open access uh, work for scientists who do not have the resources to pay for uh, publishing their science. So, uh, a lot of questions, yeah. so maybe yeah. if you can just... So, 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 so open access journals, and uh, not everybody's going to know all this, but, <laughs> but basically some money has to come to publish, to pub produce a scientific journal and do the peer review. Some money has to come from somewhere. So, I told you about what the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has done for now 20 years, I think, more than 20 years, and, and that is to to uh, make it free to everybody around the world, except for uh, the the uh, Japan, Europe, U.S., and, uh, and Australia. I think you know the only a few, there's a few countries that where you you can't get it for free except after six months. So if you want before six months, you have to subscribe as a library or as an individual. So that's one model. The other model is what is being referred to is complete open access for everybody. Then, then the money it comes from the person who's publishing it. So the scientist has to pay, and and uh, a good open access journal will will not charge scientists. Uh, who don't have the resources to pay, but many of these journals are not really focused on science, they're focused on making money. So, so, so that's what led to the predatory journals. Now, the answer is not going to be my answer, the answer is what's going to come from this major project of the, uh, the world's academies that I mentioned, uh, and uh, hopefully they will have a um, a plan that the academies worldwide will then uh, try to make work. I mean, uh, it's it's incredibly destructive to science uh, as it, it stands now. Now, in that, <laughs> the question really is very complicated because it also relates to the pressure to publish and what, what do we mean by publish and how do we evaluate publishing? So, uh, you know, this is really a, a major question that many of us have been involved in. Uh, we're, we're strongly against uh, scientific societies in the United States are strongly against the idea of using, uh, you know, citation index as, as a way of evaluating journal impact fact factor as a way of evaluating scientists. Uh, is a big <laughs> push. We want scientists to be evaluated 
on, on, by reading their papers. And so uh, th there's many schemes. The, the fundamental one is that if you're up for a promotion, we want to read your five best papers. We don't, you know, as a faculty member, we don't care how many papers you publish. We just want to know what are the five best, and we want to read them. We want the committee to read them, not not to discount them. So this is a big struggle, and this is an important issue. Again, it's the scientific community that's got to fix this. Yeah. So I think there are many, many questions, but I think in the interest of time, we'll have to limit it to this, the last question. This is from Pragya, who's been on Facebook. And uh, it says, there are hilly areas where there are school, uh, school, children who go to school, but no government schools. So uh, how do you suggest one reaches them? No, no what? what? There's no what? Uh, in hilly areas, you don't have access to schools, but there are children who are of school going age, and uh, there are no government schools. And how does one educate them? I think this would even hold good in, in this age of COVID when you do have problems and children are not able to access uh, uh, education, especially children from uh, lower socioeconomic communities. So I think the question relates to how do you make sure education gets to these children? Well, it's a very important issue. We have the, you know, I think schools are incredibly important. Uh, right now, around the world, schools are not going to school. So in the United States, they try to teach by internet. So, I mean, you could do a little bit. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I think India is a rich enough com country to make sure that every school, every child has access to a school. Uh, and uh, so I think that should be a major government pro project to make sure that I am surprised to hear that there are places that don't have access to schools, but schools are critical. And we know from uh, a lot of research that, you know, just learning by yourself on the internet for most people is not very effective. You need teachers, you need good teachers. Thank you, Professor. With that, uh you know, we uh, end uh, all the question answers. I, we again, once again, thank you for coming you. online and uh, give this enlightening lecture. We always look forward to you for your continued support, and uh, you know, and uh, your advice are very valuable to us. Thank you very much for the viewers and well, the participants. You. Who, you know, Welcome viewing this program. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you very much.